So our, our lesson this morning will serve to introduce a brief series of studies, Lord willing, that are not going to follow the traditional sermon format. It rather will consist of answering questions relating to a particular subject. I'm pretty confident in saying it is a subject of great interest to many in our present society. So that subject and the questions that we will be considering together are before you on the handout that I just distributed. And so by now you know what the topic is, racism. Although a societal issue of significant interest generally, I think you would probably concur. Recent events in our nation and subsequent reactions and responses to those events have even heightened the attention that has and is being given to this matter of racism. Don't know, but I think you would probably also agree that it is, a, it is not a misrepresentation of the subject to characterize it as emotionally charged. A sensitive, extremely sensitive topic for people to discuss. And so I hope at least you would agree it speaks to the timeliness of the subject. Now, a little background into the questions that are before you. Uh, you might notice the heading, Documentary Film Interview Questions. Let me just explain, if you don't mind, I'm taking a few minutes to do that, how that all came about. A number of months back now, uh, Sister in Christ there at Newport News that I've known many years, uh, she called me up and she uh, said, hey, uh, Mike, she said, do you remember Lynette Jones? I said, well, the name sounds familiar, but I don't remember her. I don't remember her face. I'm not sure I remember the time frame that she may have been part of the congregation, but I do remember the name. I, I do remember her being part of the congregation. She, she said, yeah. She said, well, I heard from Lynette, and uh, Lynette is uh, in the military. I think, in fact, uh, during this uh, uh, kind of time frame, she was promoted to like a lieutenant colonel. I mean, she's uh, way up there in, in the army, I believe it was. And so uh, I said, oh, and he, she said, but she's into film production. And I said, oh. So uh, the sister I was talking with, she said, Lynette asked me, her, to be part of an interview for a documentary. And Lynette asked whether or not you're still in the area. And I said, well, <laughs> as you know, I am. And she said, yes, she remembers you. She actually thinks you baptized her. And that's saying that I don't remember that, if uh, that were the case. But anyways, um, she, uh, she said, and, and Lynette was wondering if you would be willing to also be part of this interview. And I said, well, um, well what's it about? And she said, well, it's a documentary on racism. When will it be? Not sure. Sometime, uh, I think she said uh, August or something like that. Maybe maybe July. I don't remember anymore now. But uh, And I said, well, where must I go to be part of it? And she said, well, there, she's coming here. And so it'll probably be in the Hampton area. And I said, you know, I, I said, okay. I said, tentatively, I agree. I said, well, I hear from her. And, oh, yeah, yeah, you hear from her. So, you know, you ever hang up from a telephone call having agreed to something and all of a sudden you're questioning, boy, did I have enough information to make a good decision? Because I had no idea what, you know, what course this was going to take, what it was all about. And, and so I, I'm not going to lie with you. I had reservations of agreeing to this without future or, or additional information. So in time, sure enough, I get another call. Uh, and this was from a lady, I think, by the name of Irene Mintz. And she said, uh, hello, Mr. Brand, I'm, I'm a, uh, an employee with uh, a particular group. And she says, I'm working with uh, Lynette Jones. 
and uh, she told me that you might be willing to help out with an interview. So she was able to at least uh, tell me the time, the place, and then I was so glad to hear. She said, and I'm going to forward you the questions that will be part of this interview. Because that was my primary reservation. I mean, was I going to know what I was going to be asked? Was I have to do this impromptu? And all of that, all of a sudden, whew, was a real relief. And uh, so anyway, so I, I get these questions in an email. Those are the questions that are before you. And uh, as you might notice from a cursory examination of them, most of them are asked in the context of what the Bible teaches or offers by way of helpful, enlightening information pertaining to various issues surrounding the subject of racism. I got to tell you, I was so thankful to see that. Uh, and, and again, I, maybe I maybe I was not giving Sister Lynette. Uh, the confidence that she she deserved as a sister in Christ, um, and and so I but I was glad to see that I, I got to tell you I, I was feeling a whole lot better about the yes mm -hmm. that I had given a couple of weeks back. Now you will notice a few of those questions, even the first one, seek a more personal perspective. So here's what I assume: I didn't get to speak with uh, Lynette until the day of the interview, and uh, we you know despite all the social distancing and mask wearing. In fact, I took mine down to talk with somebody, and, and one of the people connected with the, the venue we were using said, would you please put your mask up? And I did, and, you know, try to be very considerate about all that, but, uh, you know, we hugged, and we cried a little bit, and she told me about her mom's passing and, and uh, various things, but uh, anyways, so I hadn't spoken with her prior to this. I offer that only to explain when I read those questions that were more of a personal perspective uh, approach, I, I was assuming she wanted me to use the same format, that is, from the same context of what I know and what I believe because of what the Bible has taught. Now, whether or not that was what she intended, that was the approach I used. And so I say that to hopefully give you trust that what we will have to say as it relates even to those questions are fitting for a preaching say. Now, why did I decide to use the material and, and this format? Well, I will tell you first and foremost again because of the timeliness of the topic of racism. Uh, Paul, over in Ephesians chapter 5, he he tells us to be circumspect, and, and he's talking to Christians and how they ought to now walk in Christ. And he says, see that you walk circumspectly. The idea is look around, be aware of your surroundings, literally just keeping your, your head, I think I heard Brother Ote say, on a swivel. You, know, you're, you need to observe what's going on around you. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And isn't that true of our current contemporary sake? We live in evil days. But that would have been true of God's people and Christians whenever they would have lived. But we are, verse 17, not to be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so I, I find even in those exhortations, those injunctions, uh, given to us by inspired penmen, God intends for us to be able to interact with what's going on around us, to be able to respond to that, not foolish, but in wisdom. And that wisdom lies, even as we had opportunity to uh, consider it the Lord's Supper and comments made there, that wisdom lies in God's, understanding God's perspective, God's words and instructions and truth as it relates to those matters. So uh, that is one of the reasons that I have decided to use this material. But even the questions, uh, I, I will tell you, as I thought about ultimately uh, the, the possibility, the potential of being given the privilege of 
providing scriptural consideration regarding racism to whomever will ultimately watch this documentary. And let me tell you, there's no promise anyone will watch it. You know, she, she made that aware to me. You know, she has to put all this together and then she has to submit it to various uh, production companies who are willing to take it on. So yeah, she told me she'd let me know, and I'm not very hopeful, but you know, if, if in fact it does make some type of public airing, however large or broad that might be, I thought about the privilege of at least being able to give people a biblical perspective on a very, again, emotionally charged and extremely sensitive subject. But then, I got to tell you, this whole exercise was personal, helpful, and beneficial. It afforded me an opportunity to take a subject, and I'm not sure I've ever, you know, just spent time studying. And these questions afforded me an opportunity to do that in a study of God's Word to to put together some thoughts for answering these questions. And it made me now feel more confident, more comfortable that I can constructively contribute to a personal conversation that I might have with a co-worker, with a neighbor, with a family member when the subject of racism surfaces. I feel better about it. Mm -hmm because of my time spent in these questions and looking at what God has to say about these issues. And so that's the reason. Ultimately, that's the reason I would share it with you. Uh, this is only a suggestion, mm -hmm. but I will make it with a sense of zeal. I would hope, maybe, that you will take those questions. Now, I gave them to you so that you can follow along. But I hope you might take them home. Now that you have them, answer them for yourself. Take time in the Word of God. Look at these questions. Examine how you would answer them if it were you that would have been asked to do this interview. So, and, and aren't you thankful? You don't have to do it before a camera. Mm -hmm. It didn't start out real well. <laughs> first, first of all, uh, yeah, we're we're going. You know, they do the click. You know, and and we start talking, and and all of a sudden the guy goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> what did I do wrong? And he said, no, we don't have any audio. He says you're on video, but we don't have any audio. So they had to correct that. And and then I told Sister Lynette, I said, I don't know if you remember me and my preaching, but I tend to be wordy. <laughs> And, and I'm thinking, you know, this was supposed to take like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And, and I said, so if I, if I start going way beyond what you expected as an answer, will you do something like this? And then and she said, oh, yeah. She said, but then I found out, and I kind of recognized this as she was going through the questions, she didn't ask them all. So I'm sure the reason for that was because I was giving her more information than she needed with some of the other ones. But uh, uh, again, <laughs> you know me. So uh, we, we're not under any time constraints, and uh, we'll just uh, take uh, what time is necessary. Uh, but I, I do hope you will find it a, a helpful exercise. Uh, if you needed some type of, uh, again, uh, kind of, um, you know, organization and, and, and structure to provide you a study of the subject, maybe this will provide that for you as it did for me. All right, so question number one, again, is one of those more personal perspective questions, but the question was, in your own words, what is racism? Now, you can only imagine, for a guy who loves words, you know, uh, first thing I do is lo look at the word, and I'm thinking, well, I see race, and I see ism. I understand race to be uh, one of the ways in which we designate different groups of Humankind. It's interesting, and you'll do this on your own. I didn't offer all this in the, in the interview, but it's interesting. When you start looking at that in dictionaries and things like that, you will find that the concept of race is very ambiguous. 
as to what constitutes a race. Uh, the, the dictionary I use, and it's quite antiquated, but it said basically now most scientists bring that down to three groups. And so I'm just offering that by hopefully helping us to understand sometimes the concept that arises in our mind when we hear the word race. That there's, there is some subjectiveness into that. Now, ism, that's, that was interesting to me. Because ism, I'm familiar with some terms of ism. The idea of a you know, philosophy, uh, maybe a, a practice or process. I, I looked this up in the dictionary, a manner of action or behavior, adherence to a system or class of principles. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true for theism? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we use that term to talk about those who believe in one God. And so it, again, it is adherence to a system. It is adherence to a, a class of principles. It can designate a worldview, atheism. It's a worldview. Then it has a more specific application when it is used to designate, again, the dictionary's words, quote, a prejudice or discrimination on a specific attribute, sexism. So I got to take all this information now and, and kind of formulate as the you know, the, the question uh, posed it as to what I would say about it. And so here's what I said. It is a belief. Atheism is a belief and corresponding behavior that centers in the notion that certain groups of people distinguished by identifying features are looked upon as inferior. Again, I looked up the word racism. And uh, racism, uh, again, is... Uh, you know, is defined any program or practice of racial discrimination, segregation, persecution, and domination based on racialism. I didn't know what that word was. So I had to look that up. A doctrine or teaching, listen to this, without scientific support that claims to find racial differences in character, intelligence, etc., that asserts the superiority of one race over another or others and that seeks to maintain the supposed purity of a race or races. I don't know if your mind immediately goes to Hitler and the Holocaust, but it does, mine does. And uh, interesting insight into that that we might offer later on, Lord will. So, now, when we think about these people distinguished by identifying features, especially as we relate it to race, Please understand, these are things over which that individual, that group of people, had no control. Skin color, nationality, texture of hair, ethnicity, the list goes on. But when, when we start talking about racism, we're talking about, again, this notion and corresponding behavior in which we look at a particular group of people identified by distinguishing features over which they had no control, then we view those people as inferior. Now, if you adopt that premise, you can understand how that would then lend itself to treating those individuals of that group as not being your equal. And that then, obviously, will manifest itself in many different ways. All of them negative. Mm -hmm. Most of them malicious. And so it could be that that will manifest itself in how you view those people. How you talk to those people. How you talk about those people. And then ultimately how you will treat those people. Now, this behavior not only takes many different forms, but has many varying degrees. It could be that somebody who ascribes to racism might just show a lack of respect to those that they would view as inferior. It could be, and again, verbal insults or derogatory speech 
So it could be verbal. But then it also gets into things like segregation and discrimination. That can then elevate into oppression and domination, persecution, and ultimately, yes, even violence and murder. Understanding that as it relates to the word racism in our nation, I offered that I believe the prominent application of racism seems to be in relation to skin color. However, I am confident in saying that's not the only application. But that's probably the prominent one, the one that first comes to mind. Now, I probably should have stopped my answer there. But, as you know, <laughs> uh, I, I use this first question and the opportunity to lay some groundwork in making personal observations about the subject to offer a few, I would call them personal conceptual observations. Again, I, I think I've shared with you, you've been with me long enough, shared with you, I like to look at things conceptually. Because if you get that right, then it's just a matter of application. Now, we need wisdom and application, but sometimes we don't see something as it should be seen. And so let me offer a few of those. Number one, as I think about racism and a conceptual observation. Friends, this has been a long-standing problem. Now, I know... It has taken on a heightened uh, posture in our nation. And I understand that. I think that is warranted in light of some things that have recently happened. But I, I certainly would not want us to naively think that this is a contemporary problem only. Or that it is exclusively a problem among Americans in our nation. Friends, this is a long standing in fact, uh, if we're, I'm not sure we're going to get to question two, but if you look at glance at question two, it's going to ask my suggestion of an illustration of racism in the Old Testament. My well, friends, that at least takes you back 2,000 plus years. Mm -hmm. So again, this is not a new problem. It has gathered heightened media attention. It, you know, it comes... It comes before us uh, in, in a lot of various mediums, but I, I just want us to understand this isn't new. Secondly, by way of a personal conceptual observation, friends, racism is a learned behavior. It's learned. And I believe that is true whether we're talking about national racism, societal racism, or individual racism. Here's what I would offer, and this seems probably to be, the, be a bit of uh, you know, evidence that maybe not everyone's willing to accept, but look at toddlers. Look at the innocence of children. Having some grandchildren that are toddler and having seen my own children grow up through those years, here's what I can tell you. They will recognize differences. But they will not make any kind of inherent conclusion about those differences. It's just, it's, it sparks their curiosity. And so they might ask me as their dad or their grandpa, they might ask me, why do I look different than so-and-so? But they have no reason inherently to ascribe to those differences a superiority or inferiority. You know where that is derived from? In my judgment, it's the answers that we give to our children's questions about it. And so that's why, as parents, as guardians, as grandparents, we need to be especially careful and discreet and discerning in the answers that we give when they ask, why do I look different than so and so? Why do why are they different? Because it is more than likely those answers that they are supplied, along with 
whatever else society is providing them by way of input. But it is those answers primarily that is going to give them some worldview with regards to these differences that they have observed, but have no means, reason to make a judgment about. Mm -hmm. So it's longstanding, it's, it's learned behavior. Here's one, I believe, conceptually. Racism is rooted in pride mm -hmm. and arrogance. And this really gives a insight into the taproot of racism. Because the Bible is very clear in identifying the pride of life as a constant area of temptation that is employed by Satan in his tempting man. We're all familiar with the verse, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, and the world there signifies that realm over which the God of this world, Satan, exercises his dominion. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So when I look at racism, I'm fully convinced that it is but one of the manifestations of the enemy's successful efforts to get people to think of themselves better than they should superior to others. And if you are able to do that, then those individuals who think that probably feel they've got to be justified in their thinking. They've got to seem to somehow legitimize why they would think that. And so, what has the enemy touted? What has the enemy put forth for them to, to possibly embrace? This notion that some people are inherently superior to others. See, all of a sudden, that takes it out of my choice to be superior. That's just the way it is. Friends, racism, like the pride that undergirds it, is the work of the devil. And I can understand that in light of its Again, being a fruit, in my judgment, of pride, arrogance. Here's another one for me. It's insidious. Racism is insidious. And let me explain what I mean by that. When you start talking about something being insidious, it means that it has, it does more harm than just the initial impact. Now, please understand what I'm about to say. I'm in no way... Uh, diminishing its primary harm. Friends, the primary harm, the principal harm that racism has is upon those who are subjected to. And I'm, I'm very confident in saying that. But I'm also confident in saying that's not the only damage it does. With time, I believe it will yield other resulting damaging effects. Among those are this. Those individuals who are constantly subjected to hurtful and harmful expressions of this racist behavior will sometimes, in return, formulate their own negative impressions about not just the individual who has exhibited this racist behavior, but the group of people of which they belong. Can you see how that all of a sudden begins to have far-reaching impact? And it is for that reason that I've offered this last one. Because what I would call that is stereotyping. And, and stereotyping, you can look it up, but, but basically it's the idea of taking what is true of one individual and then saying, well, if that's true of that individual, all those who are part of that group of which that individual is a representative, representative they're all like that. 
And so I believe racism is a cousin to, you use, and allow me to use that analogy, it's a cousin to stereotype, uh, stereotyping and bullying. We have a lot of attention given to bullying, especially young, young people. And we see how it plays out. We probably have seen it in our own lives and during school and, and especially, uh, you know, whatever settings might have afforded us that opportunity to watch people take advantage of individuals that they found vulnerable for whatever reason. They felt were weak. And therefore, they could exercise their will over them. I'm not sure there's a big difference. It's just a matter of how sometimes it is applied. What is the difference between that and racism? What is the difference between that and stereotyping? Where, where all of a sudden we are again ascribing to a group of people what one individual or multiple individuals within that group are guilty of. And so, I'm sure I could say a lot more. And I'm sure I said a lot more than what they intended by that question. But I hope it at least gives you a, a good foundation as to where I'm coming from when I answer the remainder of these questions. And again, I hope you'll take the opportunity to answer it for yourself. How do you see it? Why do you see it the way you do? Because you know, one, one of the first problems is so often defining the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we have a real good handle, at least universally. And, and so that renders the discussions that we have sometimes even more tenuous and, and more uh, difficult. Because we're, we're not even agreed on what it is. And how damaging it could be. All right, well, boy, I, I was hopeful of getting through three questions. So it just shows what and how unrealistic I can be of my myself. Right? All right, but uh, Lord willing, it has gotten us underway. Um, I got to tell you, I was initially when I read question number two. Can you give a biblical example of racism in the Old Testament? Because again, you know, we, we, we hear racism, we think of it typically in one application. So I'll tell you where I went, and that will give you an opportunity. But I hate to do that because then I'm, I'm giving you the one that you might choose. And I want you to choose your own. But my thoughts went back to early in history, especially among God's chosen people. They spent 400 years in Egypt. And they were treated a certain way because of their nationality, because of their race. Now, it ultimately, the best, at least the insight that we're given, it ultimately grew out of a sense of fear on the part of the Pharaoh of Egypt as to this group of people that was different than Egyptians, they were not indigenous to Egypt, and how this group of strangers and foreigners residing in their land was growing to such a large number. And what implications that could have upon the security of his kingdom, his land. I gotta tell you, even though not all the particulars are the same. Do you see some parallels? In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And friends, again, we have seen some horrible manifestations of racism in our land. You go back to one of those early episodes of it, you see genocide. Mm -hmm. and you, you, see, you see the command issued from the throne of Egypt. If a boy is born of that race, of that nationality, those responsible for delivering them were called upon each other. Immediately. An effort to stem the tide of this growth and their potential military prowess. But I, I just want us, again, to appreciate 
is not a new problem. But it is one that we need to we need to get our, our minds wrapped around. We need to have a, a response. Because it is going to be brought up in conversations of which we're a part. Of. And if you choose to contribute to the conversation, I hope you will find study of this nature helpful. So that you're not, as I feared, called upon to just answer a question for the first time you've heard it. And again, I was I, I, I was really concerned about that because I, I didn't know I was going to see the questions. But after, uh, after I thought about that, I, I decided, well, when she contacts me, if that's not part of the arrangement, I'm not going to do it. Because I, I had no idea what kind of questions they were coming. But when I saw these questions, I'm thinking, whoa, yes, please, let, let me take part in this. So I hope you can receive it with the same sense of potentially benefiting you and giving you an opportunity to think about these questions that might come up in, in some other forum of which you could be a part of. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if you were prepared and you were willing to give them God's perspective? Because it's similar to the cross. You have man's perspective. And you have God's perspective. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are poles apart. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate your allowing me a little probably unnecessary by way of length time to uh, give you some background to this. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do hope mm -hmm. as we go forward we can make far better progress in the future lessons, Lord willing. Uh, but uh, I do hope you will find it helpful. And uh, again, I'm just asking you, but uh, urging you in, in one way, take it home. Mm -hmm. Use it as though it was given to you. And here were the questions you were going to be asked to, uh, again, answer maybe in front of the camera or in the presence of others. And uh, hopefully that will give you an opportunity to study. So thank you for your kind attention. I know for those who are watching on our website, I know you didn't get to hear this, but the song we sang before we uh, preached was the gospel is for all. <clears throat> See, that's, that's how Christians think about mankind in general. I, I'm not even agreeable to the fact that there are races. I'll have more to say about that. But, uh, but anyways, you know, the gospel is for all. And, and that's what we sang and, uh, as I interpreted the singing. We sang it with enthusiasm and therefore conviction. We believe that. We believe that Jesus commissioned us to take that message of good news to the world. He says every creature, and we understand it's not the, it's not the squirrel probably watching behind us here, but we understand that to mean all mankind. It doesn't matter where they call home. It doesn't matter their nationality, their ethnicity, the color of their skin, or any other features. God intends for this message of good news to go out to all the world. So that certainly has a bearing on how we would feel about racism. Because we believe it is God's intent and design and privileges us to be a part of it preach to all men, knowing that they are all in need of this message and the counsel.